Well, good afternoon. My name is Anita Staver. I'm an attorney and the president of Liberty Council, an international nonprofit litigation, education, and policy organization. We deal with uh, religious freedom, the sanctity of life, and the family. Our purpose this afternoon in this panel is to discuss the influence and perspective of women on society and to share some les lessons and strategies that we can all use and ideas that you can put to work. You have bios in your uh, brochures your program so I'm not going to go completely through everything but I want to tell you a little bit about each one of our panelists today first to my left is Nancy Schultz the wife of nine-term former congressman Dick Schultz she's the founder of the Republican Pro Congressional Wives Speakers Bureau she has spoken at many national conferences and prayer breakfasts on behalf of presidential Senate House and gubernatorial candidates Nancy sang for two first ladies foreign ambassadors a congressional prayer service, conventions, and in musical theater shows. She's also founded AmericanPrayerInitiative.org, a website providing daily scripture and focused prayer topics for our nation. Next to her is Sue Trombino. She's the founder of Women Impacting the Nation, a project of Liberty Council. WIN informs and inspires women of all backgrounds to get involved in their communities. Growing up overseas in South America and overseas and other locations gave Sue a deep appreciation and love for our country and for the Judeo-Christian principles upon which it was founded. Sue is also on the board of Liberty Council Action. Corey Capel is a special assistant to the president of Florida Family Policy Council. She's, she's actually sitting on the end, which is associated with Focus on the Family and works to protect and promote life, marriage, family, and liberty. She serves in a unique and strategic role by contributing to the development, messaging, and administration of the organization. Next to her is Adriana Gonzalez, the founder of Catholics Call to Witness, a faith-based organization dedicated to upholding and promoting religious liberty and encouraging the Catholic community to participate in the public arena. She's the state coordinator of parentalrights.org, where she worked to pass the Parental Rights Memorial in the Florida legislature in 2011. Adriana and her husband homeschool their seven children. <laughs> so there's been a lot of talk about how women vote, Nancy. What is the impact of women on our national elections? What has it been and how can we have a greater impact on elections in the future? Well, first of all, women are having a gigantic impact on elections. As a matter of fact, women have decided have been uh, decided the outcome of every single presidential election since 1964. Women significantly out, outvote men. Uh, men vote uh, about, women vote about, let's see, there's about a six to eight percent spread between men and women voting. Women uh, are about 53, 40, 54% of the vote, men 46, 47% of the vote nationally. Um, in 2008, between Obama and McCain, men voted 50% for Obama, 50% for McCain. Women voted 56% for Obama and 43% for John McCain. Women elected our president. Women tend to make up their minds who to vote for by listening to people they trust, like Oprah. Yeah. And um, I think that if there's one thing this country needs, probably more than anything else, is informed women voters. Women who get the bigger picture, women who look beyond what, what's the simple issues of the day, to what are those issues connected to in terms of candidates' world views, the candidates' belief systems, these um, issues that seem so right at the time. For instance, uh, back in, in uh, about 50 years ago, the federal government decided to um, support unwed mothers. At that time, about there were less than 5% of um, babies in this born, in this uh, country were born to unwed mothers. Now there's a there's a saying in Washington that what you subsidize you get more of, 
what you tax, you get less of. Right now, the unwed birth rate in America is over 41%. 41% of the children in this country. It's become profitable to not be married. So uh, every debate, every policy, from the school board to the presidential election is connected to a worldview, to a belief system, and we need to get up to speed on that uh, in this country. Socialism is a worldview, fast becoming a socialist nation, and it's women that are taking us there. The only thing worse than not voting is voting without knowing who you're voting for and why. Women must become educated and involved and informed before they become involved. Conferences like this are the perfect way to become educated. And then, as far as getting involved, um, where is your passion? We can't all solve all the problems, so it's look within your own heart. What makes you, what is your passion? If it's the education of your children, then go for it. Go that way. Put your energies. Harness your frustration and your anger. Do your homework and think it through and then become, stand, take a stand. There is an issue right now before this country that is absolutely, as far as education goes, absolutely horrendous. And it's uh, 44 states have already adopted Common Core curriculum. If you don't know about this, if you've got children, if you have grandchildren, Texas refused it and the billions that went with it. Texas said, not, not in our state. You're not coming in here with this common corporate. It goes through every single solitary subject from math to, educate, to uh, history to it's, and it's, all it really is is very thinly disguised, disguised socialist propaganda. Now, um, Florida has the Common Core curriculum now. Yeah. And some states are actually backing out of, right. of that. That's because we learn. they're starting to, it's starting to percolate up. I, I belong to a, a Ginny Thomas and I, uh, Clarence Thomas's wife, started a, a group we, we, uh, to, of a coalitions of conservative women's organizations, all of whom are connected to one another with social media and we're going all out on this particular issue. I mean, we're blasting this across the country and, and it's starting to take hold. I mean, people are starting to go, hey, what's this? And uh, it's, it's just critically important for the future of this country, this common core curriculum. I don't want to overstate this, but I don't want to understate it either. It is, could very well be, the, what do you call that? The, the, the nail in the coffin of this country. The tipping point. So what is it going to help to help women decide how to think and vote for themselves and so they won't just listen to popular media or um, look at it as something on YouTube? You know, how do we get their minds, our minds, changed and channeled? Okay, well, every one of us, more mature women, <laughs> All of that <laughs> uh, can help. Can help. As a matter of fact, um, younger and unmarried women tend to vote left. Married women, women with a little experience under their belt, shall we say, tend to vote conservative. Uh, now, that's, I'm, please hear me now. It's tend to. Um, I'm not uh, saying that all of them do, but. Um, in the second chapter of Titus, we are given a mandate from our Lord. Older women are to teach the younger what is good, how to love your husbands, and urge the young men with self-control. Talk to young men about self-control. We wouldn't have 41% of unmed, unwed mothers if we had young men that had some self-control. Amen. Okay? So um, we have a biblical responsibility and a duty to our country 
to speak up and speak out about what is good for this country and what is not. Our founders and some of our leaders, uh, the greatest leaders in this country, were very clear about women's role. They, uh, as a matter of fact, John Adams expressed, expressed this, this way. He said, women are the infallible barometer of virtue and morality in a nation. Daniel Webster said, listen to this one, the promulgation of sound morals, and what are morals? The difference between right and wrong, good and evil. I mean, that's all it is. A, the promulgation of sound morals is a woman's contribution to the preservation of a free government. What these great leaders were saying is that the underlying strength of our very freedom and our very government is dependent upon what women have to say about what's right or wrong. And uh, so uh, how can we get up to speed? We just need to get up to speed and then we need to, sp by read, uh, by, <coughs> there are so many rich, rich sources right now. This conference is one of them. There are so many rich sources. Uh, David Barton is just a, a treasure trove of, of very palatable um, uh, information, uh, very readable, very watchable stuff that he puts out. But this little lady here is really hitting the nail on the head with, I'm pointing to, women, to Sue Trombino with Women Impacting the Nation. If you want to get up to speed in the state of Florida, this is the way to do it, women, women impacting the nation. She's figured out a very fun way to get together with other like-minded women, and you don't have to be Republican or Democrat or Independent. She, anybody's welcome to come through the door. Well, she'll, she'll be talking about it, so I, I, I won't go on and on about it, but this is the, the key. It's the answer to becoming informed and educated, and there are websites about voting records, about um, the belief systems. All you need to do to figure out a belief system is look at a voting record. So um, anyway, that, that's as, about as much as I have to say about that for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of morality and government and what we don't have in, in many cases now, uh, Corey, the, after this last election, we've all had people come up to us and just act really disheartened and to say, you know, I am don't know if I'm even going to vote anymore. And, you know, what do we say to encourage people to let them know this is not the end, this is just the beginning, don't give up? That's exactly the point we need to make. This is not the end, it's just the beginning. You know, we lost the battle, conservatives lost the battle, but we did not lose the war. And we can look back and we can see many of the things that we can do differently next time and we can learn from that. Just a couple of those areas of lessons that we've learned. From 2008 to 2012, the liberals kept their political machine going. They kept active. They continued to stay in, in touch with the grassroots organizations. They continued to build an organization, whereas the conservatives Arrested. or the Republicans we didn't even have a candidate. We didn't know who we, who we were going to nominate until that last year. So they had really three years that they were working. And while we were working, we didn't have a strategy. We didn't have a plan. Um, the second thing is the Hispanic vote. If you were here last evening, uh, you heard about the importance of the Hispanic vote. That's the fastest growing demographic in our country. And we as conservatives just didn't speak to them. We didn't have the dialogue. We didn't show them that we cared enough about the issues. And unfortunately, we made the same mistake when it comes to social conservatives. If you're a social conservative and you are watching the debates, you were like waiting, well, when are they going to talk about my issues, right? We didn't hear much about that in the news. There was so much about the economy. And while the economy was very important, social issues were pushed aside. Another aspect um, that I think is very dangerous is when you have a moderate uh, Republican, as an example, if you consider a line and you have the, the left-leaning liberal or a Democrat over on the left, then you have someone moderate, as an example, a moderate Republican in the middle, or another option, a conservative Republican over on the far right side. When you have the two candidates 
being a moderate and a liberal, your discussion of compare and contrast is right within that arch between liberal and moderate. And all the conservatives over here feel totally left out. They feel like we don't have a candidate. We don't have someone that represents us and our values. So many of the conservatives honestly stayed home. Um, very sad, but they felt that they didn't have representation. So those are the some of the things that we did wrong or that we can do better next time. Oh, one other point, social media. The opposition excelled in this area and we were caught off guard. We didn't have the plan or the implementation of the plan nearly as well as they did when it comes to social media, marketing, Google ads, and reaching out to the younger generation. So we, I think we're going to have questions at the end, is that right? Okay, thank you, if you could hold your question, okay. thanks. Um, but there's, there's a lot of room for growth. Now, having identified these areas that we can grow in, we can turn it around this next time. We absolutely can. I've been in politics now about 20 years, and I've responded differently in different elections. There were elections I just cried over, and I was devastated over. And there were other elections where I think as I've grown, as I've matured, as my faith has matured, I've now come to the realization that, you know what? God calls us to be faithful. We can't be like the swinging pendulums with our emotions, whether we win or lose. We have to stay faithful. We have to stay steadfast. The very cause that we're fighting for demands it. Uh, it, it should pull our best out of us, you know, and, and we should never, ever give up. God calls us to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. He calls us to be his ambassadors. He calls us to be salt, light. He calls us to persevere. He calls us to speak truth and love, to pray, to be good stewards. And stewardship, think about this. And I sometimes have conversations with pastors or people in a church, and they say, well, I don't know if there's, you know, that we should really mix church with politics and so on. And I've just presented the idea to them this way. It's a stewardship issue. If God gives you your family, he expects you to take good care of them, right? If God gives you finances, he expects you to take good care of it. God has given us an incredible nation, and he expects us to take good care of it. And who can do that better than a woman? We are nurturers. We take care. God just made us that way. You know, we're relationship oriented. If we do everything within our power, I really believe we can. We can win. And there was a quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer that I read just yesterday, and it just gripped my heart, and I wanted to share it with you today. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. That's right. Amen. That just cut me to the core. I'd never heard it put that, just that directly. And he continued, not to speak is to speak, and not to act is to act. So my encouragement to you is just continue to be faithful. Continue to be faithful, and God will show up and be faithful. Don't get discouraged. Thanks, Corey. Sue, Nancy had mentioned about women impacting the nation. What is when, and uh, why did you start it? Well, first of all, what we do, oh, sorry. First of all, what we do at WIN is we educate and equip women with knowledge of God's truth about our faith, our family, and our freedoms, and then we support those who take a stand for the Judeo-Christian values upon which our country was founded. And um, uh, WIN got started really because I went to a Reclaiming America down in Fort Lauderdale uh, just to get educated, just like you gals came here to the awakening. And you see, knowledge is power but it must be knowledge in God's truth. And um, freedom depends on you and me being knowledgeable. Because when you educate the man or the woman, you liberate the man or the woman. And what, what happens is, is that if you're not, um, you become less informed, if you're less informed, then you are vulnerable and easily manipulated. That's right. And so what we want you to be is informed with truth not just opinion. So we want you to be, um, uh, by the way, so we want you to just not just be opinionated. And uh, so, <laughs> so what, we, uh, what we want to do at WIN is we, what we do at WIN is we have WIN Talks. And WIN Talks are book clubs 
where women get together twice a month. You um, you get together, we, you read potty books. I meant to bring them with me and I forgot. No. Uh, um, but anyway, they're called potty books. I mean, they're real thin, tiny books. So you, if you read Ritual Intent, which I love David Barton to death, but most of you are all very busy. You have families, you have your w businesses, you've got a lot of things, and a big book like this will uh, intimidate you. I think most people, <laughs> and it intimidated me. But when I saw a thin book like this, I thought, wow, this is pretty awesome. But what you do is um, you get together by reading these books in a very fun setting with your girlfriends. And you will learn to be, again, informed, not just opinionated. And you will learn uh, not to just regurgitate what others say because it sounds good, okay? But you will be able to know what you really believe and why. And then you're gonna stand firm, uh, being able to own your religion and your morality and own what you believe and why. That's just the beginning. And so how do you get uh, women involved who normally don't get involved or even like to read or talk about political issues? How do you get someone involved who may be your next door neighbor, your friend down the street, somebody at your school, who just really um, doesn't want to turn the news on, they don't want to talk about anything, but, but they care about their kids, they care about their schools. How do you get them involved and when? Uh, I can't remember, I don't know if it was Corey or Nancy that said something very important that we do at WIN is, what happens first of all is, we want to make it personal. Because a lot of women, especially in the church, do not want to get involved in politics. And I don't know if I can say this now, but politics really, I don't either. Because poli this isn't political, this is spiritual. And politics is, poly means many, and ticks is bloodsuckers. So we don't want to get into that. But I'm just making this fun, okay. I don't know, but anyway, you can cut that out if you want. But the point is, is that what you want to do is make it personal. So you ask questions. You see, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so when I, what we do at WIN is when you come and we get together uh, at a WIN talk, it's just a, it's just a book club. Uh, the women love to get together and yap, and so we get together and you will, um, the first thing I ask you is why are you here? 15 seconds or less, why are you here? Second question is, what is important to you? Not to your spouse, not to your best friend, not to your neighbor, but to you. And the reason that is key is because I'm going to make it personal. See, because if I'm talking to you about life, see, there's five, five of us up here. We all have the, share, the same shared principled values, but not every one of us is jumping on board on every one of those because otherwise it becomes very overwhelming. Because right now, you all, I'm sure, are very overwhelmed with everything that you're learning, and you're going, what do I do? I just want to go back to my bed get in my bed, put the covers over my head, and go, Jesus, come today, Amen. like right now. <laughs> but if that doesn't happen, what do you do? So I'm going to make it personal to find out what really is important to you. Because if I find out, I think it was Anita that said it, if I find out what's important to you, then you go out and do. But anyway, but you go out and do that. You, If, if life is your passion and God, your dreams are God's <laughs> tools, Go out and do what God's created you to do. Do not worry about what your neighbor thinks, even what your, your family thinks. If God puts something on your heart, who are you to question him? So what we really do is to get women, um, I just find out and make it personal, and I find out, gosh, what's important to you? We really, we say we don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, but the reason I say that is because 95% of the people in this country have no idea why they're Republican or Democrat anyway. They are because their family is their neighbor is their spouse is. But once you find what's passionate about you, you see it becomes not about the donkey or the elephant, but it truly is about the lamb. And so therefore, when I make it personal, now I can engage you, and then I'm going to encourage you to get out and get involved and do what you do. Good. So, Let's move right now to Adriana and just uh, find out a little bit about how you got involved with the issues that you're passionate about. And how, are, how have you been able to get your message across once you figured out, yes, we have all this information that we gathered and, you know, it's in my head. Um, what do you do to, to tell others about it and get them involved? And Sure. Well, a couple of things. First, um, I've been very involved with the issue of parental rights for years and fighting on that front recognizing really that this attack on children, um, and it was mentioned here, you know, the, the core curriculum, how dangerous that is. It's really an understanding that 
if you can take the mind of the child and indoctrinate that mind, then you have the future of that nation, right? And so in that recognition, you know, our battle with the organization parentalrights.org has been to defend parental rights. And, and I feel also a burden to encourage parents to step up and act on those rights because we also realize that a lot of parents are just abdicating abdicating their God-given roles and responsibilities, honestly, to the schools, to others, to, uh, to raise their children for them and educate them, um, completely dele you know, delegating that. And so, so that, that is definitely part of uh, our message. And as of late, we um, founded an organization called Catholics Call to Witness, and of course our outreach is mainly to the Catholic Church, but our message is very universal. The message of life, of marriage, of religious liberty, of parental rights. This is the platform, that, the message that we want to carry out. We um, kind of stumbled upon, I am not a social media whiz at all, um, but we stumbled upon the, the value of social media through a video that we produced last year and called The Testifier. I don't know if any of you watched it. It was an election video. That video had so much success on YouTube, you know, just over two million hits on YouTube and been all over the news. I mean, it really, it, it exploded and we didn't do anything. It was really God's, God's doing. But it also showed us that social media is a very powerful tool that we need to use, we need to learn about. I mean, think about it. We made a video that had a message that we wanted to convey and at over two million people watched that message. Without social media, that would have been an absolute impossibility. So we need to learn about social media, and I, I'm just beginning to learn, but I've definitely learned that it is worth learning because the value of it to send our messages out and to all the people who then resend and repost and re, that this is very important, very valuable, and it also reaches a younger crowd. Corey mentioned that we need to reach the young people because that is, I mean, there's a complete understanding of that on the left. We need to understand that as well and really reach out to our young people. Um, we are also, in order to get the message out, we recognize that social media is a tool though, but it is not the end. It's not the end of our human relationships. Really what we need is the one-on-one, -on -one, the evangelization, the fellowship that is as close to, to human contact as possible. And so what our organization is launching now is a project uh, to form groups in, in churches and the goal of these groups is an outward evangelistic witnessing, going out into the community and being active in all areas, in the political arena, as well as in just serving, in praying in front of abortion mills, in on and on doing all of these activities. Um, that is the goal, but we need to understand that the goal is reached through prayer. And so very foundational. I think that Sue was mentioning there's sometimes a disconnect even in the church between, okay, well, this is we, we do just church things. They do political things. Well, no, because our faith leads us to action. Our prayers, you know, the Lord says, okay, now get up and go. How pro-life are you? Are you willing? I'm, I'm not saying to you, but just in general, how pro-life are we? Do we? Is it just a voting every two, four years? Or is it something that carries us to act and to, to, you know, to be out there willing to, to, to do what the Lord calls us to do? So that's basically what, what we're doing and to get our message out. Thank you. That's great. Uh, social media really works, but it only works with humans. <laughs> right? So we're still, it's about human contact. And how many people do you have as friends on Facebook, it might be your children or grandchildren, that when you see them, you feel a little more connected. So you talk about, oh, I saw that picture you posted on Facebook, I really like that. Or I followed that tweet. If we didn't have that, if we had no human contact and all we had was a cyberspace of social media, it wouldn't be any fun. But I can come up and I can say, oh, I remember you, I've seen you on Facebook and it helps keep connected. So I think it's all about learning social media and how to do it, but how to do it well. And you do it well only with the human contact. And I think that's what you've done, Adriana. Now with all this information that you're gathering here at The Awakening, 
you know, how do you go back and share this with other people? You don't you know, carry a USB around with you with an audio tape and say, here, listen to this. <laughs> you know, what is it that, that you can do when you get back? Um, Corey, you have experience with gathering all sorts of information on issues. How then do you get comfortable with sharing with others with all this massive knowledge that you, that you gather? That's a good question. And um, I think we become comfortable with what we're going to talk about when we're familiar with what we're going to talk about. For instance, if we have plans, uh, what is today, Saturday, uh, you might have plans to um, go out uh, with your friends this evening or maybe meet people tomorrow after church. You don't plan what you're going to say. Your conversation comes naturally because you talk about what you know, right? So my encouragement to you would be to become informed. Now, I debated about sharing this with you, but I'm going to. About 20 years ago, I was the most uninformed person you've probably ever met. I was in my early 30s, and I thought, well, what prompted me was, I heard everybody whining and complaining about government, and I heard all of this on the news, and I thought to myself, I've been so busy with my own life, I don't even have an intelligent opinion. And I confessed that to a friend, and I said, and she said, are you Republican or Democrat? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, are you conservative or liberal? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, what are you? And she said, oh, I'm Democrat. I said, well, okay. Um, I said, how do you think I find this stuff out? How do you think I, I, I get more informed? And she said, well, um, she said, why don't you call? She said, I think they have meetings. She said, I'm not that informed, I just vote. But she said, I think the different parties have meetings. <laughs> well, not, no, she wasn't that informed. She didn't say she wasn't that informed. Let me correct that. She said, I'm not that active. Sorry about that. But, um, but so what did I do? This was before the days of the internet. I went to the yellow pages. Anyone here raise their hand if you remember what the yellow pages was? <laughs> right, okay, so I went to the yellow pages. D was first, so I called the Democrat, Democratic Party and I said, I'm interested in finding out more, what do I do? And they said, oh, we have monthly meetings. I said, oh, that's great. So I put it on my calendar, the time, date, the place. And then I, I followed my, my finger down to the hours and found the Republican Party. And I called them and I said, I'd like to find out more. I said, how do I get involved? And they said, oh, we have meetings. I thought, oh, they both have monthly meetings. <laughs> I had no idea. And so the first meeting was the Republican meeting. Well, actually, I called first, and they said, oh, we have young Republicans. I said, young Republicans? What does that mean? Is that like a third party? And she said, no, 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 it's just Republicans, but a certain age group. I said, well, that's great. I'd like to find out more. Told me the time, date, place. I showed up by myself, walking in, had no idea what to expect. But they welcomed me, and I just sat in the back and listened. And at the end, they asked me if I had any more questions, and I said no. And I said, look, I'll just be honest with you. I don't know if I'm a Democrat or Republican. I'm just learning all of this. And they said, okay, um, well, where do you stand on the platforms? And I said, what's a platform? <laughs> I'm just being honest, okay? But here's what I did. I found, they said, well, if you, um, you know, what's your address? We'll pop it in the mail. Or if you'd like to come to the next meeting, we'll bring, you know, we'll print them both out and we'll bring it to the next meeting. And so I came to the next meeting and I looked at it. I looked at both of them and I thought, oh, well, I'm clearly more to the right. I'm clearly more conservative. I guess I might be a Republican. <laughs> and as I attended more meetings and learned more, it was like, oh, yes. Now, that just happens to be my personal um, experience. But where you go with this information, once you get involved, um, is up to you. But there's so many opportunities for you to learn, first of all, with the Internet now. Oh, my goodness. With organizations, there's so many conservative organizations out there that have monthly meetings, from church organization groups, issues awareness groups, to um, Tea Party groups, to uh, some Christian coalition and uh, freedom and uh, faith. Faith and Freedom Works? Faith and Freedom? Faith and Freedom. Yes, yeah. Faith and Freedom, freedom Works. Right. Two different ones. Thank you. I ran them together. Mm -hmm. But there's so many opportunities for you to get involved so that you can, you can become aware and informed. When you become more informed and more comfortable with your subject, you're naturally going to share it. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Does that answer your question? Sure. And we start with our friends. That's who we're going to share it with first, our family mm -hmm. and friends. And we also want to share it with the next generation. Um, Nancy, I know there's, you've been talking about trends. So what kind of trends are we seeing with the millennials? And how can we impact our youth? We, that's the next generation of leaders. Yeah. Uh, well, this isn't good news. Um, the Pew Foundation, the Pew uh, polling company did a uh, survey with youth 18 to 29 years old recently. 49% of the youth of this country have a positive view of socialism. That's what they've been taught. 43% have a negative view. Um, 47% 47% have a negative view of capitalism. Um, 46% less than the negatives have a positive view of capitalism. Something, what's happening here? Indoctrination. Right. Um, what happened is about 50 years ago, uh, in the early 60s, um, the Supreme Court, in all its wisdom, fell for a line, um, a misinterpretation uh, in, of an unconstitutional principle called the separation of church and state. And they dismissed the Bible and prayer from schools. Well, what, did, uh, what happened is that the left walked into that vacuum with a new, well, what we, what we threw out, though, let us not forget, has been the gold standard for character development in this country since the day the Mayflower landed. So we threw out the gold standard. And then we adopted a thing called the uh, self-esteem movement that has taught generations of children now, who are now voting adults, that they have rights to rewards, they have done nothing to earn, everybody gets a prize whether they work for it or not, perfectly setting up the entitlement mentality that we're dealing with. Now, I used to work, um, well, I used to know a uh, renowned psychologist, and he, he um, it was the largest um, group of treatment and centers in the country at the time, Minerth Meyer, some of you might be familiar with it. <coughs> Dr. Bird, who ran the Washington DC clinic, told me that he can take an addict of any, uh, a falling down gutter, drunk and work with them. What he said they do not have success with is a, is a patient that comes in with an entitled attitude. He said that's almost impossible to treat. We have a huge, huge problem in this country with an entitlement mentality. Um, so if you're, under, if you're speaking with someone under the age of 40, you cannot assume that they have any frame of reference to the true, historically, faith-based founding of this country. They don't know. They haven't been as exposed to the scriptures unless they've received it at home or in uh, their churches. So uh, you cannot assume that the Bible carries any weight with the younger generation. As a matter of fact, they're surrounded by a culture that mocks the Bible, that mocks believers. So we have to be very, very sensitive to that. And we have to be winsome. We will never browbeat anyone into coming to our point of view. We have to be, we have to be so secure in what Lori was talking about, what, what, uh, what we're all, all talking about. So secure, in, and it does come because we were reared in freedom and faith, um, most of the folks in this room. The kids have been reared in freedom to the point that it's just taken for granted. You know, they, they were, it's just a way of life. They don't know anything different. So it's not a, we get it. We get it. Our, our, my, my father fought in the Second World War. Um, we understand that there are, there's a, there's a real threat alive here. And the other thing, oh, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent, but you might remember when Nikita Khrushchev, I remember I was a little kid, and all the adults in my environment were just horrified 
with the fact that the leader of the communist world took off his shoe at the United Nations, banged it on the podium, and said, we will not defeat you, Americans, with guns and bombs. We will defeat you. Your grandchildren will be communists. We will bury you. We will bury you. Right. Try to find that on the internet right now. It's been scrubbed. OK? This is what we're up against. We have got to take responsibility in our own families, in our own communities, to make sure that we tr um, teach the young. In, in Lent, but we have to understand where they're coming from. Like St. Paul said, I've, I've become a different, I'm a chameleon or something uh, that he talked about when I'm with a farmer I'm in Rome. Rome. Yeah, when I'm in Rome, whatever. May I ask you a question? Uh, we're, gonna, we're, we're going to take questions in about five or six oh, minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, She's uh, dying to ask a question. We'll make sure everybody gets a chance as um, much as we can until three. Um, and, and we definitely have to be concerned about our youth, and we definitely have to train our own children, and we definitely have, you know, concerns about our neighbor's children. We can take our own kids out of school, but we can't necessarily do anything about our neighbor's kids. But, you know, it, we can invite our neighbor to a wind talk, and then, you know, I know you, Sue, you, you do have people that are young people that come to your wind talks. What is interesting to them about what you're doing? I see you have your stack of books. What is what interests the young people in what you're doing? You know, I think the most important thing because sometimes when you get kids, they're not going to want to read a book. But if it's a thin book, a potty book, you see this here? It's a potty book, very thin. You can read that. But you know what I think most? I think our children, and I'm speaking. I have a son, and I but um, anyway, big family on my husband's husband's side. But I think that our kids, and I think our nation is looking for people, women that their yes is their yes, and their no is their no. Hallelujah. And you know what? But let me ask you something, and I'm going to stir the pot. That's what we do at Win, is I stir the pot and I get you to think. <laughs> but if you expect others to have the, that their yes be their yes, and their no be their no, are you being that woman? Are you being a woman that is standing with courage and conviction? Because we encourage you to stand up and speak with courage and conviction with confidence, but without compromise. But you're not gonna be able to do that unless you know what it is that you believe and why you believe it and where are you willing to draw a line in the sand. And I believe that our kids, you know, when you when you were younger, I don't know about you, but I grew up, my father, I grew up overseas. I'm from Venezuela. My father was a, he was a Marine and uh, worked for Standard Oil and all that. But my father, I knew that my father, his yes was his yes and his no was his no. And you know what, there were times when I was 13, 14, 15 years old, I was I did not like my dad because he said no. <clears throat> and you know what, I'll never forget a handful of years ago sitting on the stoop with him and saying, Dad, thank you. Because kids are looking. I used to run camps for 400 and some odd kids. And I'm telling you, they are looking for the parameters. They need parameters. And they feel safe within the parameters. They do not feel safe anymore. So are you willing? To, first of all, do you know what you believe? Do you know why you believe it? Do you have the courage of your convictions to draw a line in the sand? And you know, it says, um, you know, and also without compromise. You see, the Lord says, my word is not void of power. My people are void of speech. But we must do it in love, because you're never going to bring them to our side if you're, if you're emotionally driven, if you... If you go out and you let your emotions dictate you, if you let your emotions guide you, then we're in trouble. So be firm in what you know, and once you know that you know that you know, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine with how to handle all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the techniques that Sue uses a lot is asking questions. That's the best way to draw. Well, Jesus did it all the time. Ask questions, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, and I, I'm gonna, kind of just say one thing about Matt Staver, why I am, I really feel honored and blessed to be not only at the awakening here with Matt and Anita, their, their vision, but this is really important because once you get educated and you know that you know that you know something is truth, now be very careful, there's a lot of information out there, but is it truthful information? Are you just sending stuff out there because it sounds good? Or is it truth? And this is where you're gonna to have to do your due diligence. 
And so one thing that we do is, just very quickly, this is real important, when somebody talks about separation of church and state, I already know that they don't know what they're talking about. That's right. And so what I've learned from Matt is he, he knows truth. He's on all these different talk shows and everything. He is calm, cool, and collected. You know why? Because he knows truth. Right. And I'm like, wow, that's, I want to emulate that. And that's where you don't lose your Christian witness. Because if you go off the handle, that's what they're going to put on YouTube, Internet, and everything else. <laughs> but if somebody says separation of church and state, you know they don't know what they're talking about. So what you do is this. Wow. I, can't, I am so glad you're bringing that up because everybody's talking about that and I'm just learning. So you carry these around with you, you know, four or five of them. This and is you the just, Constitution. Okay. <laughs> and, Bill of Rights. Yeah, not the, okay. Yeah, not the, any of the Obamacare that's this big. But anyway, <laughs> but you say, you know what? I'm so glad you brought that up. Can Now look at my demeanor. Can you show me where it says it there, please? Because I'm just learning. Did I get upset? See, I'm not... You know what? You, you don't want to make them feel. I mean, you don't want to make them feel like an idiot, but yeah. they are. But why do that with a Christian? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you can turn Wait a minute. Out. Sorry. If a blind man stepped on your foot, would you be mad at him? There you go. No. Okay. So you just do it with kindness. What are they going to do? They're not, they're not getting mad at me. They don't know. So when they walk away, do they, they get hugged or slugged? I don't know. Just do it in a nice way. And you know what? Do not lose your Christian witness. And that is one thing that I hope that you take back. And that's what we want to be doing at WIND, is let him be our Jehovah DC and be calm. But no, you're not going to be able to do that unless you get educated. So read, get educated, pray. That's the key. And uh, go out and make a difference. Somebody said that earlier. Go out and make a difference. Go mad. You can definitely even do this when you're busy because all these ladies here are busy and yet they do a lot. So Adriana is a busy mother and she's still able to accomplish much. And uh, Sue homeschooled and was one way she learned a lot. That's a good way to do it. So you can still be busy with whatever you're doing, whatever your role in life and get much done. Uh, Corey, I'd like to ask you one last question before we take questions. Okay. What can a woman do What's one thing, if you were to say, that she could do to help turn the culture around? There are many things that she could pick. What's one thing? Since we're here at the Awakening Conference, I'm going to tell you that one thing is really twofold, but it's it's one thing. It's think of the cross, keep your vertical relationship right with the Lord, keep your horizontal relationship right with each other so that you have that opportunity to be relational, to share with people, and be the world changer that God desires for you to be. I am a strong believer in divine appointments. I believe that that all of my days were preordained for me before one of them came to be. And I believe that each and every one of you ladies here in the room are here for a reason. You are here to specifically hear something that one of us has to share. I don't know what that is for you, but I know that God's calling you to be a world changer in some way. And it could be any number of ways, depends upon if you're an introvert or an extrovert. But please keep this in mind, as the body of Christ, we don't all need to be out there in the forefront with a microphone. I was very humble to have this opportunity, and I needed to take a time to, to pray about it before I answered and said yes. Quite honestly, to be transparent with you, because I thought, Lord, I'm the least of these. Be on a panel with Anita Staver? It was very intimidating to me. With Nancy Schultz, Sue Trombino, Adriana, I really had to pray about it. But then I remember, I really did. But then I remembered in Isaiah when the Lord said, who will go for me? And I remembered about 10 years ago, and I'm getting tears in my eyes, about 10 years ago, I said, I'll go for you. I'm just me, Lord. I'll take the trash out. I'll do whatever I need to do. I'll get involved. And I did, and I became more knowledgeable and more aware. But my point is, if God can use me, he can use you. But the key is to keep your vertical relationship right with the Lord first, because that's where you'll get everything you need. I don't need to say anything more to, the, you know, to this group. But then keep your horizontal relationship and share what you know with others. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. That, that reminds me that we need to be very careful when we say, the Lord, I will go where you 
Uh, uh, he sent me to law school when I said that. <laughs> so be very, very careful of what, you, what you're willing to do. If you're willing to do anything, he may stretch it a lot farther than you ever think. Um, let's open it up now for uh, before we go to questions. Nancy had reminded me that nothing can be done without prayer. And she gathered together with a, a bunch of other women and thought, what can we do to help change this country? And what it all boiled down to at the end of one long day of discussions and prayers was prayer. Why don't you tell us about the American Prayer okay. Initiative real quick. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, the, uh, the feminist movement back in the 60s um, was started, I've gotten to know one of the ladies, one of the ringleaders, who is now a conservative. <laughs> and that entire movement that changed this country was started by a half a dozen females on card tables in the basement of a house in California. And they changed the, the country. They started a movement very strategically. They knew what they were doing. So that was our inspiration. If they did what they did, could we not do? something similar. And so uh, Vonette Bright, do you, do you know who yes. uh, Vonette is the co-founder of the largest ministry on the planet, okay. Campus Crusade for Christ. Yeah, 500,000 trained volunteers throughout the world, 25,000 trained staff to this day. And Vonette was, uh, Vonette and I got 20 women, Anita was one of them, in a room. The firepower in that room, there were First ladies, Senate wives, uh, it was, they had to be, first of all, women of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Second of all, women that knew how to put feet, boots to the ground and get something done. And thirdly, they had to have a passion for our country. That was the, those were the only qualifications. We sat for a whole day. Let's redefine feminism. Let's, I mean, it was intense, was it not? It was spirited. And finally what happened is toward the end of the day, we were getting nowhere. And what happened is we broke for prayer. It's like if, they, if the boys couldn't put the Constitution together without breaking for prayer, perhaps maybe we better break. And 20 minutes later, just like that, it came together so clearly. And this American Prayer Initiative, what God did with that prayer was he said, first of all, before you go to change the world, will you please come to me? Amen. Good idea. And uh, the, I'll pass these around. This is how to get on the American Prayer Initiative, and, and it's very strategically designed to educate. Um, uh, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when you get to it. But we first of all, you know, people go, well, I guess all we can do is pray. No, no, no. The first thing we do is pray. Who'd like to ask a question? I know we have one right here. <laughs> For me, it's like like witnessing the death of a relative, and I've already been there, done that. I come from a communist nation, Nicaragua. I saw communism infiltrate. Um, we live here, but we lost a lot of property, um, etc., due to communism, and all of the signs have been here, and I've been seeing them and suffering all along, and people think I'm nuts, but I do speak, and what I need is help, and that's why since I don't have access to such a panel, I wanted to immediately jump in because it's not every day that I will have you in front of me to give me advice. History is repeating itself, and I think the Communist Manifesto is readily available for anyone to read, and you will see line by line that it's being exercised here. Mm -hmm. um, how do you talk to a Democrat? It's impossible. <laughs> better, it's going to be hard to paraphrase this, but she's concerned about communism and how those ideals are taking over this country. And yes. The last uh, statement was, how do you talk to a Democrat? I think Sue can answer that one. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? 
Um, yo viví en Nicaragua mm -hmm. también. I lived in Nicaragua. So, um, but, you know, I think for me it's a little different. Everybody has to take their own personal, just, you know, just your personal life. For me it's a little easier only because I've lived there. I was from Venezuela. I've, every country I've lived in there's been a coup. So, wow. um, I was in Nicaragua, San Salvador, Puerto, I mean, I've lived in the Muslim world. So, um, again, it, and I know it sounds so simple, but unfortunately, if you, it, it, this is so emotionally driven. And, uh, and I hear your heart because I came to this country and I said, we are exceptional. I dare anybody to live overseas for one year, mm -hmm. not in Paris, not in Madrid, not in London, but go live where I've lived. And I'll guarantee you, you will come here and kiss the walk, ground you walk on. Yeah. Okay? I've lived okay? in America for seven so, years. Oh, okay, Pam, yeah, okay. But, so the point is, is that for me, and I can't speak, I know Adriana, her husband's from, uh, they're, they're Cubanos también, but Oh, sorry. Uh, but so, um, <laughs> yeah. I started going to my okay, but Spanglish. Yeah, my Spanglish here. But um, the point is, is for me, I just try to make it personal, and I know that sounds so simple, but you see, you're going to catch a bee with honey, not vinegar, and you see, they just don't know. You see, they sound like they know what they're talking about. So be very careful of the sounding things, right? What sounds good, but I think with somebody that's a Democrat. There's a book that we have. We have. We're working on. There's five. So that are they, I don't know if they're Spanish, if they're Spanish or if they're um, English. But we're working on a Spanish series of books. But there's one book. It's called Politics. These well, the Take Back America book by Matt uh, is is brilliant. You need to get that book. That is the first book. It's not in this packet here, okay. but um, that is the the first book. And um, really, the series of our books are really brilliant because they will answer a lot of these questions that you're going to ask. But the Politics Easiest Pie book, that is a very economical one. But you see, how do you talk to somebody when you don't even know what they believe So when you, or what's important to them? So when you ask them what's important to you, now you have some sort of a ground to talk to them. Because if economics is important to them, you can say, geez, you know, I've got this really great pie book. I want to give that to you, Politics Easiest Pie. If you want to know how we were founded, why did you come, like for Spanish, why did you come to this country? And you have to ask them that. Why did you come here for freedom? Now, unfortunately, the Spanish, and I think Adriana or somebody had talked about the Hispanics, well, you know, you have to understand. Understand the bigger picture where the Spanish, they think democracia. Democracia, Democrat. Yeah, that's right. They think they don't know any better because you're not they're not learning all that. But anyway, so to to really answer that question, you're just going to have to ask them, what's important to you? I know that we can agree to disagree, but can you tell me what's important to you? And because uh, and then tell them who you are. Because again, it goes back to standing firm in what you believe in. I let people know I live in Boca Raton. It's the third largest Jewish community in the world. And I sa I've sat across from Jewish people and I said, you know what, I just want to let you know I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm a staunch Christian, conservative, a uh, Fred Frederick Douglass Republican, but we can, it's okay that we agree to disagree. So I'd love to know how you believe, why you believe the way you believe. So, and care about what they're listening to, I mean, what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Then you're, it's going to take the time. It doesn't happen overnight. How do you need an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight, but if you take tiny steps and get to know them, and when they see, wow, she really is staying the course. I have three Democratic neighbors to the left of me. Oh, I won't tell you stories about that. We gotta get up. But you know what? And this is please hear my heart. It has nothing to do with me. It's just God. But the last in 2010, when we won everything, I was out walk getting my dog, and she came down to me. She brought my dog back, my lab, Lily, and she said, "Wow, you must be really excited." And I go, "Why?" She goes, "Well, you guys won everything." And I looked at her. I said, "Lisa, it's not about we win. It's all about us. It's about America." Mm -hmm. And you see, I just take my experiences. And I started asking her questions. Jesus asked questions. You ask questions, and, I, and she was like, well, geez, I don't know. I didn't have to think thought about that. I never thought about that, but I do it in love. Next thing you know, she says to me, and I have meetings all the time at my house. I mean, I'll have 110, I have Alan West, 110 people in my house. I have all the time. They don't know what's happening at the house. But she said, you know, I've been watching you, Sue. I said, well, that's pretty scary. <laughs> and she laughed, and you have to make it fun. Don't be so serious all the time. And then she goes, you know, I admire you. She goes, you're really making a difference. And she's a left-leaning person. Wow. And yet, 
I'm just staying the course. When I know they have their Obama signs on, it kills me, but I go, hi, good morning, oh, God help me. <laughs> but you know what? You kill them with kindness because the only thing, like Nancy said, is going to be prayer, but faith without works is dead. You cannot just pray. You get up and you do something that's out of your comfort zone because if it's in your comfort zone, you're not going to make a difference. God, like Anita said, is going to stretch you, and you know what? That's when you're going to make a difference because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us Hallelujah. and do something so big it's doomed to fail unless God be in it. Mm. May, I add some, may I add something yes, to that? Please, Lord. Just very quickly, when we communicate with those that may not agree with us or that staunchly disagree with us, how we say what we say is just as important as the fact that we say anything or, or whether we say nothing at all. It's how we say it. We have to we have to have self control. We have to speak in love. We have to we can speak firmly. We can speak with passion, but we have to uh, speak with principled persuasion rather than um, some of the, the absolutes or or um, the, the condemnation. While while we may feel just exasperated with a person. We can't let that exasperation get to us. We have to pray for the self-control because without the self-control, we won't be able to continue the dialogue. If you don't have the dialogue, you can't sway someone's mind. You can't sway their opinion. Something that my pastor said one time um, just came to mind. Rules without relationship results in rebellion. So if we give someone a thought or a perspective and we don't have that relationship or we aren't communicating to continue that relationship and build that relationship up, they're going to rebel against what we are promoting. Um, another tip, if I could, um, something that I just heard recently which is really resonates. In today's world, with the media and with us as visual, just quick thinkers, if you can communicate in a story, you can communicate more effectively. Stories and pictures. Parables. Pardon? Parables. 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 Right, stories and pictures. Here, here's an example. We're winning the, the war on abortion. Why? Because, slowly, surely, womb. because we can now have that image of the baby, mm -hmm. both in the womb and out of the womb. Mm -hmm. We're winning that based on a picture, and a picture in someone's mind is the value of that baby, right? Mm -hmm. We're losing the war right now with gay marriage. Why? Unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of women, even 10% more women than men, are saying that, that should be okay. And the reason, because we're relationship oriented, we as women, we say, well, you know what? They just want to love each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you I'm can just love whoever you want to love. Just don't call it marriage. I'm in agreement with you, 100% agreement with you. But I'm saying that that's some of that's part of the perspective out there. So when you when you have when you have um, a gay couple, a homosexual couple, and they're saying, well, we want these rights because, and they paint this picture in your mind, my friend, my partner was dying and I couldn't access them in the hospital. The well, they could have accessed them it's in the hospital through other means, building. right, through pre, pre planning and advance right. planning, right. Yeah. But they're painting the picture, and that picture is very powerful and very emotional. Yeah. So my, my suggestion is to paint um, or to communicate in pictures if you can or examples or parables. So, thank you. Do we have another question? Uh, can I add to what you said? About my, my if you, husband, have, husband, if you have a question? Well, it goes along with what she's saying to support it because my husband was a firefighter and one of the things, this picture you want to paint, the most horrendous kinds of conflicts, quote, domestic conflicts, mm -hmm. were between homosexual couples. My husband said that every time they would have to roll up on any kind of domestic quarrel between homosexual couples, it was terrible, bloody, awful. It is not a pretty picture. Anita, can I chime in? Yes, please. Quick? Also, with the conversation of speaking with other people who are not like-minded, um, Corey mentioned divine appointments. You know, she mentioned having the relationship with the Lord very intimate and very alive in our relationship with each other and divine appointments. And I think that one practical thing that we can do and that I often do when I remember is every morning pray for the Lord to bring someone that it's their moment for us to speak to them. Because obviously if we go sent by the Lord, 
then our message, you know, it falls on open ears and our message is clear because it really comes from him. And so we're kind of waiting on him, not kind of, we are waiting on him and, and acting on his prompting. And I just want to tell you real quick, a, a little story about that. I engaged in a conversation with a woman whom I had just met and it came out in that conversation very unexpectedly because we had agreed on so many things up to that point that she was a lesbian in a relationship, okay? Turns out, and then I honestly, I at that moment, I was a little taken aback and she saw it because we had just been so in agreement with so many other things. And um, and she, she, we actually were open about my taking. She said, oh, you're, you don't know what to say. I said, I honestly don't. And then all of a sudden, the Lord put on my mind, tell her about me, tell her about your testimony with me, your relationship with me. And so I began to share with her my relationship with Jesus and the sweet communion that I enjoy with him and, and the just that loving relationship that I would never trade for anything in the world. And she looked at me and she listened and, and she said, I, I know and I would want that. She was even, you know, I, I could see that there was something there that she was longing. This was clearly a divine appointment. I saw her about a year later, we ran into each other, and she told me then, she said, you know, all this time, I've been living a lie. She said, I am out of it. And it, the, the, whole, the whole experience was such an ordained God appointment, and I think that that's, that's, there's a lot of power to that, that we don't go out on our power, but we go out on His power. Amen. Amen. That is really perfect. That's really good advice because too many times we want to just take our own knowledge because we've been educated. Let's just take that out and spread it to people. And it's going to fall on a lot of shallow ground. But there are those appointments that if you ask the Lord who to take you to, that he will set up and orchestrate. Um, I just want to talk about appointments, um, especially with our Latina friends. Um, this, in the state of Florida, last this last election, there were 238,000 new Latina Latino voters in Florida. They voted 60% for Barack Obama. That was about 143,000 votes. Barack Obama won the state of For Florida, and without Florida, you do not win the presidency by 73,000 votes. Okay. 238,000 new Hispanic voters in the state of Florida, 60% voted for Barack Obama. That's about 143,000 Latinos, Latinas and Latinos voted for Barack Obama. He won by half that, okay? Um, after this last election, Karl Robes came and spoke to a group that I belong to in Washington and he held up his little white blackboard that he uses and he said here are the numbers he said without getting at least 40 percent of the latino of the hispanic vote we cease to exist as a party in um i think it was 10 years or something we cease to exist as a party so what i'm challenging the republican groups that i'm talking to around the state of florida bring one latina friend to the next meeting mm -hmm and bring one more Latina friend to the next meeting. We have got to reach out. Now, it, it was, um, a statistic or a surveys were uh, telling us that the, the Hispanic community was truly uncomfortable with Obama uh, policies, but nobody from our side knocked on their door. Nobody called them, nobody emailed them. I made phone calls. Well, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's, that's too strong. We, I mean, the the opposition had one. Nobody is too strong. Okay, I'm. I'm a, you know, it wasn't nobody reached out, but very very little outreach to uh, Latino. Why don't we play out with this? And why doesn't she talk at some of the Republican groups? And then we bring our friends to come to the Republican. Exactly. Exactly. So that suggestion is to 
have a Latina speaker at a Republican Absolutely, so I think it's which fabulous. is what we're doing. And, and, and been the, saying this last that. group that I spoke to, I said, how many Latinas do we have in the audience? There were five. I said, there's your committee. <laughs> Start your committee right there. That's it. We need to make friends. We don't want them to succumb to this false government that we're that is being built. I mean, this is a lie. We cannot let them fall for this. Right, it's not about gaining votes. No. It's about changing people's hearts and minds so that we can win it's our country It's about back. inviting them to the dance. Mm -hmm. That's yes, all we have sure. to do. Mm -hmm. Just invite them to be to come. Mm -hmm. so that the universities are a uh, source yeah horrendous source of brainwashing. Yes. I sent to the University of Chicago no. in, in the year 2005 a brilliant conservative Christian young man. Today is not a Christian um, and he is not a conservative. There are many times of you <coughs> send our young people in churches or recommend because of Bright Future Scholarships or whatever you want to whatever they are, because of money, because of the love of money, we send them to the secular universities and see them spoiled and ruined. But that's another speech for another day. We have one minute, and I want to give a little unabashed plug for our WIND conference this fall. If you like what you've heard and you want to see more of them and Sue and others, Bonnet Bright is actually coming to speak at our WIND conference this fall. And Star Parker. Star Parker will be there, and we're going to have dinner with her one night. A star-studded event, I guess we could call it. <laughs> Do you want to say a little bit more about that, Sue? Uh, no, just you know, come and get educated and bring, everybody here needs to bring, you know, at least one person. It's here yeah. in Orlando. It's in Orlando. It's a, just go to the wind table. In your packets, you should have received a card. But get some more cards and um, take at least three, you know, for... Uh, the Trinity and take at least three and bring three bring three don't just bring one bring three but just get educated and um, uh, it's know. a Friday and Saturday night November, November the 15th, 15th and 16th, and 16th and, like 5 30 at night and we're gonna have dinner on Friday night and then Saturday we go from like nine o'clock in the morning till about four four thirty five six seven no, we have just well we'll end on time I'm really a stickler about time but we're going to have a great time. We have a lot of really good speakers. Oh, Kathy, if you like the ones uh, that you Kathy heard here, yes, Kathy Tricoli is going to do a concert. concert. She's really yeah. a lot of fun. Yes. So. The uh, 950 WTLN, the they offer half tuition to young people to come to Christian schools throughout the area, and that has that people can go Well, thank you all for attending. We sure appreciate it. Thank you.